to this, uh, to this session on, on Beyond Equity. I'm Stephanie Bauer from GIZ, German International Corporation. We are implementing development projects with the Indian government, but also for foundations and other actors. We work with SIDB and in some of the banks here in India, and we are very excited to host this session today to discuss with you how social enterprises can be financed beyond what is mostly discussed here at this forum, equity. So Suncap has been very successful in getting together over years the community in terms of getting impact investors together and the social enterprises, the, the businesses that the impact investors increasingly look at. But I think the next level is to get also the banks and other financial institutions on this platform. Because as businesses mature, we also look for other types of financing. Uh, we need to discuss how banks can potentially look at this segment. And that's why we want to discuss in this session today how banks can also look at this segment. Maybe they need to innovate some of their products and processes, the way they look at them in the appraisal process. These are questions we want to potentially discuss today. We see some positive signs in the banking sector as of now. We have uh, here maybe with us today, it's not yet clear, Yes Bank, who is um, setting up an incubation program potentially, uh, looking at how some of the selected social enterprises can become uh, bankable over a certain period of time. We know that SIDBI is increasingly looking at this segment and we also have obviously a lot of the thought leaders in the room with which we will discuss uh, this issue uh, in the next one and a half hours. Uh, SIDB, YesBank and GIZ, we have jointly together come to, uh, to do that study which we will present also today to you some of the initial findings where we said what are innovative financing instruments, what are innovative processes, how can banks look at this segment potentially differently. So we will present some of the findings today and uh, therefore encourage the discussion and get the feedback from you uh, in order to then also advise how some of the banks could, could go forward who are potentially looking at the segment more. Um, for, the, yeah, for setting a common understanding, maybe we also uh, briefly uh, say what do we define as social enterprises here. And I would say let's agree on the definition that we look at enterprises that are active in the underserved uh, markets, that are active either in the rural space or at the bottom of the pyramid segments in the semi-urban ur uh, urban space. We also would uh, define social enterprises as those that have particular business models that bring uh, low-cost solutions in certain uh, products and service uh, sectors which are uh, looking at healthcare, water, sanitation, for example. We also look at social enterprises or businesses uh, that create livelihood opportunities for the underserved uh, regions, for, for population in these regions. Uh, we also look at business models or, or businesses uh, that um, create um, business ownership, so involving uh, smaller players in actually owning potentially a share of the business. We see a lot of businesses, for example, in the artisan space where, where this is the case. And um, yeah, we also look at businesses who generally create livelihood opportunities in the underserved regions. So this is uh, part of the definition. Uh, if we look at where these businesses are active in terms of sectors, we would uh, see we see a lot in agriculture and rural development, in financial inclusion, obviously, education, vocational training, water. Uh, healthcare solutions, clean energy, clean tech, uh, affordable housing, and now also increasingly rural tourism as the sectors in which uh, these type of enterprises are active. If we look at the more soft measures that are difficult to, to compare, we often see that social enterprises are more mission driven. That is often said. They have a different, uh, different vision. We have discussed this this morning also. Um, so, this is some of the parameters on which we would like us to, to agree uh, here in this group. So with this uh, definition going forward, I think we, 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 we can discuss how banks could potentially look at this segment. Um, we need to discuss also, are these businesses different than conventional MSME? Um, based on the definition I give, we would say uh, they are a bit different. And should we therefore also rethink some of the processes in which we deal with, this, uh, with these businesses? I have recently met a bank uh, from Germany, GLS Bank, I don't know if you are aware, 
they change the whole way they look at these businesses. They only serve social enterprises, be it from uh, kindergarten uh, enterprises that are active in, in, in childcare education uh, or to the clean tech sector. And they say, we do a total different uh, appraisal process. We ask, who wants you to do that business in this community? So they have a whole different way of, of appraising the viability of a business, turning the frameworks around. So uh, these are things that we would like to, uh, to engage in the discussion. And uh, yeah, I look forward to all your active engagement and, and discussions and questions and uh, yeah, posing some challenging questions to also the panelists. So I wish us a good, good session. Thank you, Stephanie, and uh, thank you for sponsoring this session. Uh, this is really interesting. Uh, my name is Anurag Khare. I am from the consulting services practice at IntelliCap. Um, welcome you all for this session, Beyond Equity, Innovation in Financing Social Enterprises. So I will take a couple of minutes to walk you through uh, some of the key findings from a study that we have conducted. and. Set, up, set it up as an introduction to the panel discussion later. So uh, let me start with what's going to be major themes for this discussion. In, um, we plan to have discussions and uh, debate around three major themes. Um, first is, should banks proactively meet the financing needs of social enterprise, given its relevance in the inclusive growth of the economy? And that's why we have a lot of bankers on the panel. The second, uh, we would look at some of the emerging innovative solutions uh, catering to the social enterprise financing need beyond equity. So in last four circle, we have been talking about equity, equity, equity. And uh, taking some clue from the morning uh, session, I think the market and the enterprise and some actors are there in the field now. And now we are trying to see if there are role for other financial institutions to come in and support the growth. And that will lead us to the third theme of the session. What is the way forward? Uh, what interventions are needed and by whom to enable these finances to social enterprises? Uh, so some of the numbers. Uh, social enterprise. The first question that we looked at this study, what is the debt demand that we are looking for? And um, this is around $540 million across various sectors. But before that, I just wanted to bring our top-down view of also of the government, where planning commission and other government agencies are placing incre increasingly important importance to innovative and entrepreneurial solution in socially relevant sector and underserved market. So that sort of sets the context of the policy and the regulatory level. Uh, but coming back to the size, uh, as Stephanie mentioned that we looked at specific sectors and all the life cycle stage of the organization, both early growth and mature. Uh, there is a lot of breakup, but I just wanted to look at the uh, in the summation of the debt demand, and that comes to about $550 million across agriculture, rural development, education, vocational training, water and sanitation, clean energy, technology for development, and low-cost healthcare delivery. What is the characteristic of this demand? 78% of this demand is for uh, fulfilling short to medium term working capital need. Because the majority of uh, nature of social enterprise, and they are in the service sector. Against the debt demand, let's see how much equity has been invested. If we look at uh, uh, this figure from uh, VC Edge, uh, it says that by the in the period 2012 to 17, about one billion dollar will be invested um, in social enterprise as social venture investment. So $540 million of debt demand, against which likely equity investment of $1 billion. What are the challenges that social enterprise faces in accessing uh, debt? Uh, I think these are usual suspect. Uh, 
lack of collateral because majority of them are asset light businesses, uh, lack of flexibility in repayment structure, high interest rate, legal interest structure limitation, especially with respect to cooperatives and producers company. And that is more on the side of equity actually. Uh, so social enterprise from the government definition point of view is a subset of MSME. But what we found characteristic wise, there is some differences. So in terms of uh, size, if we say total MSMEs in India is about 58.9 million. Out of that organized MSMEs are 29.8. Uh, total uh, social enterprises about 2,300. These are the similarities. Now, if you look at the differences, uh, and that's where when we uh, look, at, when we discuss it with banks and the challenges they find in financing MSMEs, actually these differences make it easier to finance social enterprise because uh, legally they are structures. 80 percent of them are structured as a private limited companies, while 90% of micro, small and medium enterprises are structured as proprietorship, and only 3% are in PLCs. Uh, obviously, PLCs find it easier to raise capital and transfer ownership. Social enterprises, in general, have a very professional management team. And the banks, which find uh, when they look at MSMEs, there is no proper accounting, uh, lack of financial understanding, all these from some problems are not present in social enterprises. Other character is that primarily they are run by the first generation entrepreneur. So um, some of the emerging innovation that we try to find out in uh, financing social enterprise beyond equity. And before that, let me uh, identify some of the best practices which meet the challenges that are there in financing MSME in general. One, it's a disparate client base. Uh, for example, urbanization level is lower than advanced market. There is a low bank revenue per client, poor data availability, uh, business financially not so literate client in MSME segment, uh, and poor business environment. And some of the best practices identified to meet those challenges is develop a granular understanding of the markets, radically lower the operating cost because low bank, the per client revenue is low, manage risk innovatively, empower SME client beyond finances, and engage with government. When we looked at the emerging innovative solution, these are broadly into three categories, uh, product innovation, process innovation, and a specialized channel. And uh, against the best practices, uh, we mapped these, pro uh, these uh, emerging solutions. So uh, venture debt model, innovation branches of SIDB, which, is, which has come up very recently, and customized credit appraisal processes take care of the best practice of developing a granular understanding of the market. Similarly, uh, again, loan syndication program of SIDB uh, venture debt model, lower the operating cost. Securitization is a, another way of managing risk. Loan guarantee program uh, is sharing the risk. Uh, innovation branch imp empowers MSME, MSME clients, and uh, CGT MEC type of scheme engages government in increasing the credit flow to the MSME sector. So against this background, against the demand uh, supply situation, some of the emerging innovation model, what is the way forward? Is it uh, the process innovation or a specialized channel? For example, uh, RBI has also uh, provided a regulatory view that uh, dire directed credit program is more effective when channelized through specialized financial institutions other than banks. And then we looked outside, looked at the social bank, a GLS bank that uh, Stephanie mentioned and other such banks, um, which has a specific sector focus in extending credit. And when we compare their financial performance against the mainstream bank, both pre-financial crisis of 2010 and after, we found out that actually their financial performance is also much better, both on loans, deposit, assets, equity, and total income. 
For example, on the uh, total income side, sustainable or social banks uh, is about 16% uh, and uh, traditional banks are close to 7%. So there is, uh, there is a financial uh, rationale as well. Or we look at process innovations like uh, insurance product, underwriting program, etc. Or we look at the product innovation, um, discuss various product, uh, equity like debt, could be PRI loan above foundations, uh, pooling of securities, zero coupon bond, loan guarantee funds, community investment notes, revolving loan fund, equity loan assistance. There is a definition attached to that, we will discuss during the uh, with the panel. But the most important thing that we are trying to understand here is what is which is most feasible and most relevant in giving the country context, given in, in, in Indian context. So that sort of background uh, for this discussion, um, is there a role for bank uh, in financing social enterprise? What are the emerging models? Let's understand that a little bit better. And what are the solution uh, going forward? So with this background, let me introduce uh, my panel and I ask, request them to come uh, and occupy a chair here. Mr. Shiv Kumar, he is with Kotec Bank. He is Executive VP, Agriculture, Corporate Loans and Finance. Mr. Sanjeev Jha, uh, CEO of Intelligro. Mr. Seem Gandhi uh, with Ratnakar Bank. And Nandita Prabhu with IFMR. And Mr. Dilip Kumar. OK. Um, Mr. Ravi Tyagi from SIDBI. So we need, uh, excuse me, one more chair. Thanks. Hello. So I think now I have an easier role here because I get to ask questions. And my panel will answer those questions. So let me start with uh, Mr. Shiv Kumar. Uh, agri lending uh, is perceived to be a risky area. That's a conventional uh, understanding. But uh, Kotec Bank has started with a small beginning in 2003 with 63 crore of lending portfolio, if I'm not wrong, to about uh, 5,000 crore now? OK. So even better. <laughs> so how are you approaching this segment differently from other banks and other financial institutions? Yeah. See, uh, some of the steps that we have taken is, uh, number one, there was a clear understanding that uh, this sector required a uh, specialized method of recovery. Because uh, as you said, when the mindset is that there is a higher level of delinquency in the segment, you need to have faith in the system in the sense that you need to create the manpower requirement so that one, you need to give a signal in the market that this, this is not a social sector for, there's no free lunch. So you need to have a very strong recovery setup over there. Uh, our experience is that while uh, the recovery setup can be effective, it is actually more effective than the urban segment of lending because there is a certain skill sets with respect to different sectors. Uh, like I was just discussing, the MSFP and the agri sector in our country has just been scratched on the surface. And uh, luckily for us, fortunately for us in India, the agri sector is a 12 uh, month active sector where you can do business all throughout the year. Well, the MSME segment has yet not been understood or it has been looked at as a peripheral segment for the simple reason that to reach out to that segment is a difficult thing. You need to create a large team base to understand the segment and deliver it regularly. But we have an example of successful NDFCs who have done that. Uh, they have managed to penetrate the segment and today there are NDFCs which have got single product activities in each of the segment with book sizes of over 10,000 crores, so it's not a small segment either. <coughs> and finally, what I see is that the initial specialization, I mean, creating a specialized team, when you uh, put up a team of people who are focused on the segment, you get better returns. I 
probably think uh, banks have not been able to do as much as the NBFCs have not been able to do is because in a bank you've got the pressure of having to do right from corporate loans down to the retail loans. So in a branch sort of a setup, you have people who have to handle maybe a car loan, a scooter loan, all the way up to a, a large corporate loan also. So it is not easy for you to develop competencies in each of this and at the end of the day you need to get a serious understanding of each of these sectors and they work very differently. The agri sector itself works very differently. For instance, uh, today if I were to look at a commodity like rice, the way the rice millers work in Punjab or Haryana is very different from the way the rice millers work in Gujarat or in Tamil Nadu. Okay, and the scale of these rice millers is very different. You've got people with turnovers of 1000 crore plus in Punjab and Haryana to someone who is running a rice mill with a 1 crore turnover. It's the same segment but the understanding is very different. The way they work is different, the financials are different. Unless you don't do it very focused, you just can get lost. And our experience on, uh, with the tenure uh, ex existence is that the GNP ratios in this segment is as good as any, any other segment. Okay, so, uh, I think the, uh, So granular understanding of the customer segment, that's where really uh, you developed specialized skill and focus sector teams. Uh, related to the, uh, let me come to SIGB. Uh, you have an increasing focus on the micro and small uh, sectors. Within this sector, social enterprise from the MSME D Act, uh, from the regulation point of view still get categorized as uh, social enterprise. As MSME. Some of the challenges that you that bank generally face in MSMEs are not there with the social enterprise. Do you think it's an emerging business opportunities for the bank? Yes, I think uh, it's it's very critical for all of us to understand what different banks are doing and what different NBFCs are doing. We talk of NBFCs and hotel banks. So typically you know, a private bank would be interested where there is a lot, lot of working capital flow already happening and then they can make business models around it and fund that sector like this. Most of the NBFCs are into asset based financing. There may be some personal loans happening but they will identify one product like we said. A single asset which they understand very well and finance the asset. But there are a large number of uh, SMEs and including, I would say, largely in the service sector and in the social enterprises, which will fall in the same space. You know, which are small businesses which need working capital for that particular business, and it's it's not a business which is which is a different business. So somebody who gives the money has to take a little bit of project risk there. Now that's the kind of missing money which a development finance institution like SIP focuses on. While we do our commercial activity in a big way, uh, we have a focus on that. So for that first initial measures has been that we have set up the credit guarantee fund which encourages banks to take a little more risk because there is risk in service sector enterprises and social enterprises in new economy companies also, in the new economy companies in technology in whatever is happening in the market. So there is a big credit guarantee fund which at least uh, gives comfort of that loss to the bank. Very high quality professionals, very high quality professionals in social sectors also. So that's where we brought the venture debt. We said where someone has, you know, got customer engagement, has started revenue, even though, you know, uh, they may have losses or something like that, we started funding them through our venture debt product, which we said will make it milestone based. So we feel it's good enough. He has the machine ready. He's good for revenue. So we start giving money in small doses, put some milestones, help the company grow. And it has worked well. So we, we were piloting it for some time now. And now that SIPI has engagement of eight commercial bank innovation branches, we have plans to scale this uh, product up and we have our own learning. So SIPI itself did about 30 companies in the last one and a half years and all of them are doing well in fact. You know, none of them has defaulted. For the last three years, cycle has gone, they've absorbed the money and they've grown, they've got angel funding, venture funding. So it's been a good experience. I think that's one of the critical things. So social, whether it's a social enterprise or any kind of enterprise, you know, business model has to be there. If the revenue is not there, then the only way it can be funded is by equity or grant. So that's what we differentiate. The debt can come as an alternate fund, fund arrangement. We can structure it. 
you can make it cashless for a couple of years for them. But still, in the end, debt is debt. You know, there is an obligation to pay it back. So that crystallization of the business model is very clear. Customer engagement should have happened, and then only the companies, social enterprises, should start taking up debt. So I want I will come back to you to understand more about the innovation branch uh, uh, of Sigvi. Um, but before that, let me come to Sanjeev and. Uh, you are in NBFC, which has started the venture debt model. So, first of all, for the benefit of audience and us, what is venture debt, and why did you feel the need of this innovation, innovative uh, product? So, uh, so let me first introduce Intelligo. Intelligo is a subsidiary of. What we said, I mean, Telegram, as you know, uh, we have been working with social enterprise for almost a decade. And the major uh, product of Intelligram uh, prior to Intelligram coming into being was uh, we were mostly uh, into equity advisory. Uh, and we said that uh, let us try to see what we can actually bridge in terms of equity. So the industrial banking services uh, uh, dealt with several uh, social enterprises, primarily in the five six sectors that you had in your presentation. During the course of that learning, we felt that there is a huge uh, need of debt, and the debt uh, for such enterprises uh, is not uh, easily available, especially from banks, and because of all those factors, which is primarily uh, collateral, uh, cash flows, and uh, other various aspects from which banks lend. And those were the primary problems for uh, uh, for uh, for those social enterprises. So we debated it internally, and we said that let us see if we can uh, we can uh, come out out with uh, some innovative uh, way of uh, lending to those enterprises. Uh, we started as a small incubation, and during that time, uh, Shell Foundation uh, gave us grant uh, to to incubate that product. Uh, it was almost uh, 18, 19 years back. And then, uh, then over the year, when we learned uh, how to how to do that lending, uh, we uh, set up Intelligo. Uh, Intelligo is a subsidiary of Intelligo, and uh, uh, the initial capital was uh, uh, invested from the proprietary capital of Intelligo, which was very small. And considering the gap that you just now said is 540 million dollars, the gap is uh, quite high, and we don't think uh, we could uh, do it alone from Intelligo's. Uh, Capital. So we went ahead and raised uh, equity. We raised a small equity at this point in time. Uh, we are 26 crore committed capital company. Uh, in the last uh, 15 to 18 months, uh, we have uh, lent to almost 25 uh, social enterprises in the country across various sectors. Uh, and in majority of those sectors, majority of the companies we have actually lent uh, with our collaterals. We have led to startups as well. Uh, two startups we have led, which was uh, in the conceptualization stage. Uh, it was a huge risk for us. We took collateral over there uh, because obviously there was no revenue uh, coming in and there was no cash flow that we can verify. So our lending is primarily into three factors, and those three are extremely important for us. And all of those uh, needs to be really checked in uh, before we give the loan to that company. One. Uh, is uh, the entrepreneur who is uh, running it. Uh, he really needs to be an entrepreneur. He just, it's not a part-time job that he's trying to do and, uh, and uh, essentially uh, see where he can uh, an alternative career or something. So the entrepreneur is extremely important. The second most important factor for us is the viability of the business. I mean, we have seen several education companies, we have seen several healthcare, we have seen several non-credit financial inclusion. We don't lend to credit, finan credit uh, financial inclusion. So we don't lend to microfinance. Uh, so there are several companies which come in and, uh, uh, and the filter is quite high. So uh, uh, the viability of the business is extremely important. And if the business is not there to scale or sustain for the next few years or several years rather, uh, we would not lend. Uh, the third important thing, which is the most important thing, is the cash flow. So our lending is not. As you know, lending is money back business, so the money has to come back from the cash flow, not from the fund flow. Uh, so these three are important uh, criteria for us. And we don't bother whether the company is loss making, we don't bother whether you know the company has enough security to give us or not. Uh, 
uh, we try to take the business security uh, most of the times. Uh, if we don't feel comfortable, we still continue to work with the company, but we don't give loan loan at that point in time. And probably we work with the company for six to nine months and see if we can work again. Uh, we have done it to few companies in the past. Uh, so according to us, venture debt is essentially uh, the huge risk that we are taking, and venture capital or venture is risk. So for us, it is a risky uh, debt that. Trying to find out ways to be innovative. Trying now find uh, trying to find out ways through which we can actually supply our uh, capital to them and get the money back, of course. Uh, and yeah, so so I think we now understand venture debt a little better, and also social enterprises know where to go for this kind of debt. Um, coming from product innovation, the other innovation which we have seen is in sharing the investment risk and uh, Asim coming to you, uh, Asian Development Bank has provided uh, in the past partial guarantee to the Knakar Bank for lending to microfinance institute. Beyond the transaction, I just wanted to understand how it helped the Knakar Bank to uh, deploy the capital in the sector. Uh, so let me begin by saying, uh, you know, banks work on processes. So also the money we deploy is the money which comes from depositors, right? So it, uh, until unless you reach a level of efficiency where the decision making, even though I mean I completely agree that you for social enterprises for sectors like agri, microfinance, you require specialized teams, and unless it becomes a process within the organization, the scale will always remain small. And therefore, even though you may have viable opportunities to give debt to. It is. It's not possible for commercial banks to take that call because it's not an ad hoc decision. It's they're a highly regulated entity, and therefore our decisions are also up to scrutiny. So it's it's not today that, and because there is no clear distinction of uh, social enterprises from a regulatory perspective, you know they are part of MSMEs. You need to really have a strong business case for a bank to lend to you. Now, what did the ADB uh, you know guarantee uh, do for us? Uh, you know, Ratnakar historically. Uh, you know, is I mean, if you know the history, is very old bank. It's recently undergoing a transformation where it's a new management, new business focus. And microfinance or financial inclusion is a very key uh, focus for the bank. Uh, microfinance has also come up to curve over the last, you know, seven, ten years. You know, so there is there is a lot more recognition of the industry, of the players. It's there's a lot more standardization of how the processes work on the field. There is uh, regulatory acceptance, and you know, in the last I would say 18 months, there's a lot more uh, intervention to make it, uh, you know, uh, I would say from a risk perspective, uh, you know, to contain the regulatory, you know, or uh, uh, external risk. So the ADB transaction, be, uh, you know, as a guarantee, it allows the bank to uh, lend to an MFI with a risk sharing where ADB would share a certain percentage of the risk and the bank would share the rest. What it does is that uh, to a certain smaller or let's say a mid-size MFI where our uh, credit process would not have allowed uh, you know, a loan to a certain extent, the, the, the guarantee allows us to take a higher exposure. Uh, very clearly though, it has to be understood that the, the MFI has to be you know, a viable enterprise. It should have passed through our credit process irrespective. Uh, in this program, ADB also has a credit check. You know, they also, I mean, they did credit check for all the MFIs, and they had to pass through that process as well. What is different is the fact that, of course, the parameters we use to assess an MFI. We have a different rating model. We have a specialized team which goes and you know uh, monitors these entities. But the fact is, it allowed us to take a higher leverage, and therefore allow these, you know, some of these uh, MFIs would probably be the biggest lender today, purely because they were finding it challenging to get debt from banks. And because we could take that high exposure now, they can build that portfolio. And also, therefore, you know, allows them to go to other banks and say, okay, we've got debt from the market now, could you please also look at us more positively? So the guarantee only allows, you know, uh, this, I mean, leveraging unless, you know, I mean, unless there is a strong business model there. If that's not there, the guarantee is just a okay. It really doesn't, you know, cannot change, you know, eliminate your credit risk. So that's very important point, uh, and hearing from all the panelists that. There has to be strong business model already for the banks and NBFCs to fund it. But uh, as you also said, you also said that commercial bank uh, 
as a established processes. The seasons are a full scrutiny. So these guarantee programs uh, really help you to share the risk and uh, help you to the flow uh, credit to the sector that you wanted. Let me bring IFMR uh, view here, Nandita. You have done so again, uh, building on the theme of the risk uh, sharing. Uh, you have done an MSME securitization uh, from the start. Uh, how does it help uh, to flow, uh, increase the flow of credit to the sector that is really important for the economy? Um, let me just take a step back. I think uh, today it's, it's, there is a fair amount of clarity that the financing, yeah, within the MSME and particularly the socially relevant businesses is significant. Um, this gap will only widen as the economy grows if it's, if it's not sort of uh, met with a mix of debt and equity. Um, and, really, and clearly innovative modes of financing, particularly in our capital, uh, the way we look at it is that we do this through a range of structured finance uh, transactions that we undertake, uh, including the securitization of the score. Uh, including guarantee programs, risk participations, and uh, such other programs. How does this help the various uh, stakeholders? To begin with, for an originator who participates in a securitization transaction, uh, what this brings about is, is clearly ability to access debt capital markets, mainstream debt capital markets, uh, which it otherwise on its own individually would have not been able to. And why do I say this? Uh, let me just bring an example of, uh, of, of what we actually set out to do, uh, which is actually a global first. We call it the multi originator securitization. What this does is pool the underlying receivables of a set of institutions, uh, which could range, which could be fairly small in their individual portfolio sizes. Uh, but what it does when it sort of pools in with many other in in entities is that it gives, it gives the pool an automatic geographical diversity and enables them, these individual entities then to raise money from the mainstream financial markets uh, through by way of securitization. I think my capital's role in this would really be to provide credit enhancements and thereby also increase the credit rating and the credit worthiness of this, of this paper itself. Uh, what does this do on the other side? To the investors really it enables them to get access to, uh, in a sense, a better rated paper and like I said, get access to a geographically diversified pool of assets uh, which otherwise individually for them to take on their homes would have been uh, very good. Great. Uh, just to begin a little bit deeper on the process and efficient side and come back to instruction tomorrow. Uh, you touched upon that uh, the better understanding and better understanding of the customer segment uh, that you are catering to is required. What kind of processes are you deploying? So, um, I heard that you have a facility of door stability of agriculture home. Uh, help us understand better uh, what kind of process innovation are possible in your sector and going beyond. What are the learnings for the other sectors to use? See the uh, SME sector itself has got, uh, it, it's, it's a wide gap. If you were to see, it uh, covers enterprises which have investments in plant machinery all the way from, well, it was 10 crores, but it's now come down to 5 crores, all the way down to somebody who doesn't have any assets at all. So, and there is a very large geographical reach. And uh, for us to do relevant uh, businesses, we need to go deep down into the non other Sector, which means that even as a bank, unless you don't have local presence, it's going to be difficult. Initially, when we had the limitation of the bank's uh, branches, we had to settle for giving them term lending options, which was uh, therefore you wouldn't need a direct presence of the bank branch. But as we go along, we have found that uh, for the customer to be sticky around with you, we need to give him both working capital as well as term loan options. Uh, as a process, like uh, as he rightly said, the 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 amount of focus that a bank can do into that segment in this segment is directly a function of the culture that the management brings in. There are certain banks which are which would do MSME from the for the sake of it, or probably they would go through an indirect route. 
there are there are not too many banks which are very comfortable going it directly. They would approach it through corporates, through intermediation, etc. But that seriously does not give you the experience of doing the segment. You need to develop uh, your own expertise. The credit has to be assessed at your end, really. Uh, we need to develop a process of gradual improvement of the credit uh, structure, which is that initially when we started the process, we had a little bit of, we would limit the size of the loans that a person could get. Uh, we could start off with not more than 10, 20 lakhs, and then build the experience over the size of the loan. Second thing is that you also need to uh, develop geographic experiences. It doesn't make sense for you, you're not, uh, it's not a kingdom that you're building overnight. You need to develop geographies in which you have comforts, and there are very clearly identifiable positive and negative potential segments, and negative markets from the view of behavior of customers. You need to identify these, otherwise you're going to make mistakes. The most important thing as you also mentioned is that banks are at the end of the day using public money. So at the end of the day, you, you can't be lending to this segment. You also need to appreciate the fact that if you did mistakes, it's the segment which gets the bad name. You could do mistakes, but somebody is going to make a, a statement saying that the agri sector is bad. The sector cannot be bad. Okay, every sector is as good as it gets. So you need to do all the endeavors in terms of developing the right models for credit assessment, both term loan as well as the short term. You also need to understand cyclicity. Okay. And the other aspect is that uh, the, the availability of the products has to be dovetailed to the segment's requirements. For instance, you've got new products which are available, warehouse financing, commodities, uh, commodity financing, short term facilities for the season purpose. <coughs> the collection has to be dovetailed with the cash flow season. You can't have a one product fits all sort of a situation. And that again has got regional nuances also. Like I can come to say, over the process of building this portfolio, we have realized that there are very clear geographic or regional disparities in terms of people's ability to take loan and the way they behave with the loan. It can be loan or it can be equity. In our country where we also need to understand the laws are not very strong. You, uh, it, it's not the same situation as the developed markets. While it's easy and while it may be politically correct to say that we need to lend to these vulnerable segments, tomorrow if the money doesn't come, it's going to be very difficult. And they are, some of them are holy cows. You can't go about, you know what happens in that segment. So you need to take these into cognizance. And unless you're not going to build a model which is viable, you, the management is never going to give you the, uh, the, the push that is required to build on this portfolio. You know, if, if you're going to be having an average delinquency of 3 to 4 percent and you make a spread of not more than 1 to 2 percent, this business is not going to. You become the social enterprise. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's, that's critical to understand that. So like I said, we have developed expertise in that we have dedicated teams for collections, we have dedicated teams for credit. And we've got dedicated teams which also identify markets. The last thing which we have now started doing is that we've also started having dedicated branches. Typically, a bank normally would like to put up branches in tie one or two cities. That's the best place. The, the, the money is sitting in Mumbai and Delhi. But then unless you're not going to be having your branches located there, and even there you need to have intelligence. But the RBI is putting pressure in terms of putting branches. There is intelligence which is required. You just don't put branches anywhere you want. There is a way to do it. And you, you have got very fantastic markets, even in those rural markets where if you identify, you can make the branch a viable model. So all these things have to be done as a dedicated team because if somebody is going to be focused on multiple aspects, you may have got to appreciate the requirement. Like your data itself mentioned, the, the gamut of MSME itself is very large. Within that, if you want to focus on the socially relevant sector, unless somebody is going to take a focus on that, you can just keep doing MSME and you can say that I am reaching there. And in the Indian context, nobody has crashed the surface. So there is so much to be done in each of the segment. Unless you are not going to have a focus on each of these segments, you want to find it difficult. 
give you an example. The weaker section was a requirement for banks for eternity. But the real focus on the lending to the microfinance segment started with the bank. But the RBI put a condition that unless you don't reach that 10%, you could be punished. Okay, now banks have become intelligent or they are creating the experience. So I would therefore say that to that extent, the role of the regulator is very critical. Along with that, the environment for collections and the environment of ensuring uh, recovery is very critical. Yes, I mean, in that, the, the help of credit trading uh, credit agencies or the credit guarantee scheme does work seriously. But obviously, unless, because you have a credit guarantee, you just can't go and lend to account like an iron. Your premium is likely to increase in the near, near future if the delinquency is going to increase. And seriously, if you see, even if you see the credit guarantee scheme, the, uh, the amount of uh, banks which have taken, the, the type of banks which have taken credit guarantee scheme, there is a lot, there is a clear difference between the way the PSU banks have approached it and the private banks have approached it. There is something to be read in the way it has been held that way. Because, uh, and that's that's how the uh, unit approach the market seriously. Okay. Just because there is a credit guarantee, you just can't go lending with your eyes closed. So you mentioned something very interesting that we have only scratched the surface and never seen finance. Let me take this point to Mr. Ravisha uh, and also about the innovation branch bringing it here. I think it started very recently and it's again a model similar to a venture model. Uh, is there an intention to take it, spread it out geographically also? Maybe go to Smaller, smaller towns in the future, is that the reason? So I think uh, the concept of innovation branches and comes from what Mr. Shakumar said. Whatever you try to do, you have to understand in depth what's happening around it and build processes on that. Now, innovation financing requires several innovations, not only processes, when you fund innovative businesses and then you say within innovative social uh, businesses. So there may be for places from where you get money which is you know which is cheaper or which can take higher risk or a credit guarantee fund which has a different objective than the fund, typical funds which banks would raise for lending commercially. So you know you can bring you can converge one is the resource side of it and also build specialization of how to handle innovation because handling innovation for a lender is very difficult. So once you have some specialized processes you learned your lessons or you learned your, uh, had your learning over a number of enterprises when you understand that how to handle the innovation, how to handle the uncertainty, how to monitor these uh, you know, enterprises, how to get it together. So to expect a normal commercial banking branch manager who is doing a number of things and whose hard focus is commercial business, to expect him to suddenly do two social enterprises businesses, he just not look at them. Because there are so many complexities for him to handle. He is used to as they say a hard process driven transaction. But this is not a hard process driven transaction, but still you have to bring some process in it. Whether it's a way of it might be a longer process, how to understand that business. It's, these are all businesses have different business models, so there is no standardization, it's not a cluster kind of thing, everybody's trying to do something differently. Too much of innovation management thinking is very different. So you need you need to create processes which could be by way of having you know, accredited advisors who really are serious advisors, who work for you, not for the company, for the lender, you know, who give them the right advice, who monitor the company for them. So you have to break those standardized processes and the government feels, yes, every commercial bank has a mandate because government is the owner of commercial bank, so their, their vision can be different from a private bank's uh, stakeholders or shareholders. So they feel that commercial banks can have certain dedicated branches which work for innovation business. And simply could provide expertise and guidance to all those branches. They work under a common program, so there is some structure there. But somebody is, well, you know, bringing it together. So that's the concept of innovation branches. We have uh, agreements with seven eight branches just started, and we are also in the process of still, I would say, you know, incubating the incubation branch model, and probably uh, get scaled up uh, in the coming months. And uh, this year it should be a big year. We are thinking of using technology. We have to bring, we have to create, you know, every, every social enterprise also needs a marketplace. It's not only a marketplace for its product, 
Once you put money in a company, you need someone else to give him money. You need a later an investor to come in and give him money, and that investor needs a marketplace to get out of that investment. So probably we are thinking, can there be a technology solution for it? You know, it's a little venture kind of space. It's not a hard commercial space. That's what there is the concept. So, uh, so as uh, we are understanding that uh, really a very deep understanding of the customer segment that you are working with is required. And given that social enterprises are working on a different model which is a risk, return and impact, uh, there is a lot of um, clarity still required in terms of the social uh, value that they create. So with this background, let me come to a scene. Uh, is it better for banks to directly work with social enterprise or work through an aggregator or a BFC like IntelliGo? Because it will take you some time before you can develop that understanding of the sector. Is it uh, better to deploy capital to an aggregator? So I would put it, uh, it's, it, it's sequential to a certain extent. Uh, you know what an aggregator is doing is it's already there. It has knowledge, it has people. It's developed a skill set and understanding of the enterprise. And therefore, it brings certain you know knowledge to you which you are yet to develop. Right? So it can, uh, the way we look at it is that tomorrow, for example, in IntelliGo or uh, other aggregators, when if they have certain loans which you know we can securitize, right? So we buy those loans up. At the time of doing that, it's by uh, you know by force that I have to understand what business he is in. I have to understand what the underlying entities are. So I just, I create uh, an understanding of you know these uh, businesses within the organization within my risk architecture, right? By without taking a direct risk on that, right? I'm still taking a risk on you know on the aggregator and saying. You know, and I'm actually more worried about his processes. And therefore, when I do a scrutiny, when I do a due diligence, I'll be looking at what you know, what you know, their processes are, what kind of you know, security, uh, you know, what 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 is their understanding of the same. That helps over and over. And so therefore, once this flows through the system in a bank, you know, and there is a direct, uh, I would say, history established, then tomorrow when we have to, if assuming we think three of these. Then you know those that we have on our portfolio to secure it, we could look at these entities directly. There's a lot more acceptability of those enterprises in the system because you know because they don't fall in your regular SME, right? So they're not they cannot fit into. I mean, if we pass on these loans to our SME uh, team, they would not fit there because they, I mean, they have certain different perspectives in terms of their focus on you know on, on uh, social value creation. Their their difference in terms of the customers they are focusing on. Is there a difference in terms of the economic value that they believe they should add? So they may not be, you know, they may be pricing themselves in such a manner that that's affordable. Yet, you know, they it, it may not be the best pricing that you know uh, should be from a pure business perspective. So it builds a little credit history into the bank, and and it also uh, when we build it directly, it's going to take a long time. Yeah, I mean, it's the fact that what you need is people who understand the segment, right? So, so we need to start hiring people who understand these businesses. You know, they need to start understanding banking. So it, it's, it takes a long time. You know, when you look at things like agri and microfinance, they've evolved over a period of time. It wasn't that you know you one day started you start sending to MFIs and it was available. Uh, my sense is, and today we're doing it for micro enterprises. So today we we started about a year ago lending to some companies which lend to micro enterprises. And slowly we've learned, yes, there is a model. And when you talk about these micro enterprises, these are the ones which are very small, you know, you don't, I mean, you know, power rooms or people who are, you know, doing poha making in some back of beyond, you know, village. We did, as a bank, you would, even if you had a branch, the branch would not be able to really focus and say, okay, I understand this business model. But when I, uh, you know, would buy that portfolio, you know, maybe I'll go and visit some of these clients. Maybe we'll, we'll understand, you know, what the process that company is following. And we learn from that. So, uh, single uh, some of these single product focused companies can really you know help you you know go up that learning curve faster because they have evolved to that extent. And for us, I think, and going uh, from a broadening the market perspective, lending to them and then direct lending would both coexist as you go because there's a lot of, lot of demand and not everything is satisfied by yourself and by a bank. So you work with the individuals while we continue to grow your individual business. 
it's like this, uh, the decision on whether to go directly or through an intermediary, it's, you can never do 100% of either of them. Buying and pleasing is in the right mix is absolutely required. Even for a large bank, what happens is that in all these banks, as we said, as a process, you've got two types of people. One is people like maybe the business team, which knows the direct market. Then there is a management which sits in Mumbai and doesn't know anything for the sector. It's not easy to convince them to start building up a hope. If the intermediaries like Intellicap or an IFMA, when they come out with products which are far more sophisticated, at least for the, the, the credit company and the management, these are more uh, these are routes which can be taken towards getting to the sector. Then through that, when they do a couple of transactions, they see it's not as bad as it sounds. Then they start using the direct method to reach out to the customers themselves. But the bank's requirements itself is so very large that you will necessarily need to do part of it directly and part of it indirectly. Also, there is also a limitation to the army that you can generate. When the size of your team becomes large beyond a point, it has its own problems of corruption, uniformity in terms of handling the customer. Process need to be disciplined. We are not going to be disciplined at all as a country. All these are issues. If you can imagine, if you are a thousand member team, should everybody should think on a certain wavelength. Okay, attrition, all these issues, need, it, it becomes a challenge. So it, it works up to a point. After that, you do need intermediaries who can help you in creating the book, understanding your processes, your markets. It goes without saying. So it's not that you can take one route and reach wherever you want. So uh, coming to Sanjeev as an aggregator, where your focus is on the social enterprise. But as an MVFC, when you approach bank and understand your business model, you place less emphasis on the correctness side of uh, uh, based funding. But when you approach banks for your financing, uh, do you still get the requirement that your portfolio should be well secured through collateral, etc.? I'll have limited experience to answer that because we have recently started approaching banks uh, in our own country. Uh, see, look, let me just try to uh, be on the bank side and try to explain this. Uh, if I look at it, our business is primarily uh, lending uh, uh, to enterprises which are, I mean, of course, uh, there is management team, there is a PNL, everything is there, but still it's uh, not a proven track record. Right, so there's a huge uh, element of risk uh, that we are taking, and therefore, obviously, our filter is extremely strong. Uh, it has to be really, really process driven, really uh, a different approach altogether, and probably respond to the approach part to later. Uh, but from bank's point of view, if suppose they are lending to me, I mean, lending to Teleco, I and mean, Teleco in turn lending uh, to these enterprises, and for some reason, irrespective of the approach, irrespective of the filters and irrespective of the methodology that we have adopted to lend, the loan goes bad. There's no way that uh, a bank uh, will get that money paid. That's right, right? So, so, so essentially, bank, for, according to me, I mean, should really, uh, because if they are lending to us and we in turn lending, they have to really take a risk on us. Uh, and uh, in our case, uh, if we are unable to grow, Need the similar requirements or the bank's credit requirement becomes difficult uh, for us to borrow. But at the same time, I think there has to be some kind of a coexistence and some kind of formula that needs to be worked out where uh, if banks are, are not able to uh, uh, lend to us because of these reasons, there has to be some way or the other so that the inflow can come into India, I mean, it is like in Telugu, which can in turn go out and lend. Uh, but if banks take us uh, a hard stand that if you don't provide uh, ABC to us, we will not give you and in turn we are, because we have a limited uh, capital and uh, even though it's a permanent vehicle, uh, the money comes back and we go and we basically lend it back. But at the same time, uh, the capital is limited. Uh, 540 million dollars is a huge amount. So obviously our financial issue is with. So maybe SIPI or maybe uh, some other international agencies would need to look at uh, individuals like us and provide us uh, some kind of a, uh, a lending support, uh, if not equity, uh, so that we can actually do this business uh, really well. 
So, uh, I think I can tell you. They have, they, have been, they have built up a large portfolio of banks and lent through them, and yeah. there is no collateral there. So, so in fact, I was coming to Nandita and just kind of add to that question. Uh, for social enterprise which has risk return and impact rate, uh, basically a couple of people bottom line businesses, in addition to financial return, they are generating social On the other side, we have various types of capital available. There is a foundation of philanthropic capital which require very less return. There is a conventional capital from banks which is available. There is impact uh, investment equity available. So when we talk about financing social enterprise, is it really a challenge of supply of capital or engineering the finance of social enterprise? Because uh, every enterprise, when it starts off, um, has some element of uh, equity that they have signed off. Whether it be the, be the promoter's own individual network that he's set in, be it friends and relatives, there is some basic equity that he would start with. But what you know, what is really needed to sort of show up that and uh, leverage on that is the debt capital. Uh, and and uh, I'm sure many entrepreneurs here would agree that. That, in a sense, becomes a, becomes a very big uh, element of the way their own business plans pan out and the way they're able to sort of take that forward. Uh, that said, of course, uh, every business through its life cycle will certainly require uh, different types of capital at different stages, uh, be, it, be it equity, be it equity like, which is long term mezzanine capital, um, mainstream commercial capital. Uh, it, it would depend on the lifestyle, life, life cycle of the company. Uh, but having said that, I think every enterprise at the end of it wishes and aspires to be at a stage where it attracts mainstream commercial capital. Um, and thereby, you know, there really, that, that really demonstrates their ability to sort of uh, uh, be able to grow and be able to meet their business plans. Uh, because mainstream business capital is something that is, that is certainly Imagine if you are giving all the powers, what would you do to catalyze this market? Actually, it's an open question. Maybe whoever wants to jump first. So, uh, the four basic requirements, as I see, uh, which and that's predominantly from our experience of the microfinance, which is also a social enterprise, which has moved more towards now. You know, uh, more commercial, right? First is uh, asymmetry of information. So today, uh, the challenge is how much. I mean, as a as an organization, the you know the, there are different models uh, in each of these social you know, sectors, whether it's education, water, sanitation, housing. Uh, where I mean, how do you get the information on various models, how they're performing, right? Uh, uh, you know, what is being successful, what is not being successful. So there is lack of if there is a lot more information available, there is, you know, from a building a, I would say, a knowledge base within an organization, say, okay, these are some of the things which have worked, which are not worked. So let's look at, maybe these entrepreneurs are doing better because these models work, right? So there's, a, there's information which needs to be, you know, inclusion flow that needs to be uh, encouraged. Two, typically, if, you know, for each of these entities, we have to measure risk. Now, when you are, banks are a standard risk rating model, right? You evolve risk trading models over the other as you learn. But you also benchmark them against what's available outside. So if rating agencies are following those kind of sectors, you say, okay, maybe we rated our you know, portfolio like this, but this is what the market rates these kind of loans, right? And that over a period of time brings you in a symmetry or in, in alignment how the you know as the industry grows. We don't have any focus from rating agencies on you know these kind of social businesses, or at least not to my knowledge, maybe that is. Uh, for example, with SME, there's a lot more focus and you get a lot more research and you get information on you know, sectors and their potential and their risk and that. Third, in terms of funding per se, uh, you know, the fact is most of these organizations would require long term, I mean, by the time they require working capital, you also require long term. Right? So banks find it challenging to have long term you know, funds available. Largely, you know, it's, it's more developmental finance institutions which do get support in terms of long term finance. So if there is refinance available, right? So I know for example for microfinance there's refinance from Navar. So all the loans that you can give to MFI, 
you can get refinancing is that for almost at least about five years, right? So if that happens, you know, then there is, a, you know, there is uh, to, I mean, you can't have an asset value in this much of the time. So you, you are, then you have those funds available and the cost of funds. What I'm deploying, if your expectation from a commercial bank is that we're going to give you funds which are looking at a social impact value, funds which are not at commercial rate, then I also have to be able to raise funds below my cost of funds to be able to give you that fund. So that can come over through refinance. So if, if you know, uh, index institutions look, start looking at refinance, you know, for these at, at a lower cost, I still have to maintain that spread because I have to, you know, pay salaries and, you know, earn, I mean, return, pay the return to stakeholders. So I think these three are, from my perspective, uh, you know, uh, most critical. On skill development, you know, there's a lot of focus uh, of, you know, uh, I mean, there's a lot of funding available to some of the, uh, I would say, social enterprises from you know, various grounds, uh, etc. If that can be channelized towards areas like training, skill development. So when you have to develop a workforce, you know, which goes out, maybe what ZB is doing is learning from that experience. If there's a program, we could send five of our loan officers to learn what they, right, what they learn while working. Then, then there are more and more banks who, you know, have, you know, without real experience on the ground, but have learned from somebody else's learning. So these, I mean, I would say, you know, that's what really help banks over really the So my uh, view would be that can there be a clear definition of what is a social enterprise? Because you know you have to start with that process, and then you know those social enterprises should have a strong voice, which there's a lot of things what he his wish list for start happening. The government has a lot of money. I mean, just to bounce some figures on you, there is a scheme known as, you know, TOFS scheme, where government gives some interest subsidy on textile loans. The government has spent 25,000 crores on that for the last 7 eight years. And I'm just telling you the quantum of money which the government has. So if there is a sector which is really there, and which is really big, and which is really, you know, somebody can tell what it is and define it and take it to the government, and tell them that any loan that is given to this sector, please give a subsidy of 4% or 5%. So every bank is interested even, what a bank would be interested to do it because it becomes commercially viable for them. But I think the first critical thing is what is this social sector? So it runs across multiple sectors. There could be a social sector in healthcare and social sector and but I think there has to be some quantifiable, measurable, you know, parameters which define something as something but something as a social sector, so that there is no clarity on that. What is a social sector? Number two, you ask for a magic wand, so a, a magic pool of advisors who could help banks understand social businesses. What will happen in this business is somebody who can understand the promoter because banks really will find it tough. So if there is a magic pool of some, you know, advisors, which some evangelist of social sector can get together, encourage it, then it creates. It's a big help for the sector. And uh, finally, you know, uh, as he said, uh, a very lenient and loving risk department which allows you to keep on doing a lot of lending to the social sector and brings down the very stringent bar. So I think these three things together could, you know, uh, create. But I think the first level, if, if there is social sector, social development is the first responsibility of the government of any country. I think it's not the responsibility of banks at first level. The government of that country, if they want, they put one lakh crores for a social scheme. That's what is happening in Narega and all those schemes. So if there is a sector, they just have to subsidize it. They don't have to give the whole money. You know, they just to do a small inter uh, interest subvention and it will happen. Even development agencies could do that. So that's my wish list. See, the uh, sector, now the commercial banks are verified in terms of uh, the, in, the amount of efforts that they are put into the sector. The only thing the commercial banks I would like to tell you is that the commercial banks currently would like to ensure that they can protect their capital. Okay? They are not making usurious monies from the sector. Because if you were to look at it, I mean, and the government itself has come and has not putting gaps in terms of the interest rates to be charged. Okay. This is the first time that the government has decided what a sector can levy on the customer. Okay, so that's that's what it is. 
Number two is that if you were to look at the levels of gearing that banks do to this social sector, I'd be surprised. So if we were to think that currently banks are averse to the segment, banks are seriously doing funding in this segment because if you were to look at the balance sheet of companies, like since I, I can tell you this because uh, our average ticket size is a crore, okay, uh, less than a crore, which means that that's, that's not very large. In this segment, on the, the way the balance sheet is read by a qualified chartered accountant, gearing at which banks lend is in excess of seven to eight times, which would be shocking any other segment, unless it is yours, okay, where they've been doing it at ridiculous rates, and they face it. So that's the other thing. So it's not like banks should be vilified in terms of not having done enough on the sector. The third one is what sort of data is available in terms of the success rate of the sector. Okay, if banks were to lend to the sector, the social sector, or whatever it is called, and if the success rate in terms of scalability of the sector, in any of this, sanitation, water, power, whatever it is, if the success rate is not known, obviously you, you're going to have a problem in terms of banks putting money into that. And typically if banks are going to be lending money for five and seven years, unless you don't know what is going to happen in the near term or you can't have cycles wiping out the sector. Uh, and like I said, again coming back, you can, it's not easy for you to recover the money. You, you can probably have to write uh, for instance, the amount of uh, meeting that banks have taken in the microfinance level of Vanta is not a joke. So, if I had a wish list, one is that if I can get data of what is the sector success rate, okay, and in, in the, the other thing is that many of the customers don't even know what they want when they come to ask funds from the bank. They don't even, the business model is very critical. Okay. Either you go for asset as collateral, you go for cash flows, or the third one is at least you've been in that business. Okay, like even stocking. When we look at uh, venture funding or people who take uh, in the intermediaries, you typically want them to have Gain some experience, have been in the business for three to five years, or maybe even three years. If you see the second cycle of microfinance industry, a lot of companies which were there in the range of with, with portfolio size of 50, 60 crores have all disappeared. Okay, which means that there is something called as critical size beyond which then it, it stands a chance. So that is that is what and the margins left to banks is one two percent. It, it's not easy. He was talking about the Navar uh, refinance. Again, it's not as nice as it sounds because the condition says that you have to lend at 3% over the bus of funds. I don't think it makes sense also because your overheads on that for lending itself is more than that. You need to provide for at least a percent. Two percent is the running of the show. So, which means what? We are asking for a zero return. Company. 
and uh, if suppose they get that or 10 crores over the period the next three years, they probably will not sold a single percentage in their company. So that is very cheap as compared to equity. Uh, what they really worry about is, oh, this is coming at 20 percent, this is coming at 22 percent. So we should not be taking that. We should really be taking equity. But uh, that's what I'm seeing. The readiness is not there. So readiness has to really come. And then there needs to be a lot of education, there needs to be a lot of uh, uh, training and they really need to understand why that is important for their business. Uh, yeah. I think um, these single most important things is really about awareness. What is a social enterprise and like some of the kind of pointed out earlier, what uh, constitutes a social enterprise is really very, very critical. I think one of the ways in which this needs to be also benchmarked is uh, what is the social impact. So um, we need to have sort of defined terms of what is a social enterprise in terms of the impact that it creates and the value that it has sort of created within the uh, within the overall ecosystem. Um, I think that's 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 one of the critical things. So the definition and the um, measurement of impact uh, that's sort of some of the Additional uh, items that probably we as a working in the sector have on our list, and hopefully the uh, some of the organisations that have formed, uh, like uh, National Association of Social Enterprises, which was formed in Sankar last year, and the Council of Impact Industry, which was formed this year, hopefully take it to the regulators and develop that understanding among the various stakeholders. So I guess at this point of time, we can open it for. Question from the audience, and you can just put things your name and organization in your question. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Amkur. I belong to this organization called First India. We run uh, uh, people who the primary health centers in the slums of Bombay. You can okay. Uh, this is more of a reflection rather than a question uh, because the, the, the theme that I got from the panel discussion was that A, banks are really process driven and B, social enterprises need to be uh, more uh, aware that debt doesn't come easy. Now, uh, the reflection because uh, we raised some money through equity like instrument about a couple of years back, uh, we, when we, now we are planning to grow, so we approached uh, one of the big banks for debt. Now, in a health center like ours, there are three things that go into a health center. A, the working capital, which is funding the salaries of people. B, funding the equipment. And C, the construction of the brick and mortar uh, the stuff. Now, uh, the reason why after the visit, uh, at least I believe equity is more preferable than debt was, A, when we approached the bank, uh, funding equipment is not a problem because they would like to check directly to the equipment manufacturer, be it the CDC machine guy or the x guy. Uh, working capital again, it's, it's a, it's, it's, there's a bit of confusion whether which bank which uh, you know, will allow working capital or not. Agree, that we have discounted, discounted out. The biggest problem that we face is when we construct the equipment or we construct a clinic. Now, as, a, as an entrepreneur, I would want to construct a uh, clinic in the least uh, cost way possible, which means that I employ a local carpenter to, um, to do my foundation, a local guy to do my painting. The moment, the moment when say we approach a bank, they would say, okay, the check will not come to you as an enterprise, the check will go to a guy who does the foundation, which means I have to employ a guy who will do the subcontracting, sub in turn increasing the cost of construction by at least 30 to 40 percent. So hence, as an entrepreneur, at this point of time, correct me if I am stating a very naive uh, uh, remark. At this point of time, equity or equity-like or even a grant-like instrument seems more feasible because for me, flexibility in terms of time, flexibility in terms of cost is much more important than, than the rest. At this point of time, I am employed. Uh, so, please correct me. It is important to understand uh, uh, the terms flexibility and cost. So, uh, what I meant by debt is cheaper than equity is in valuation terms. So, if suppose the loan is for five years, 
you probably end up uh, say if you've taken a crore rupees of loan and it's coming at 20 percent. So in five years you have done 80 lakhs of interest repayment, right? Uh, but the crore rupees that you have actually raised as equity in the first year, uh, and for that you have valued 25 percent in your company, and that company would have got valued uh, in the next five years. Uh, maybe five times that uh, what you have raised. So you have obviously saved a lot of uh, uh, ownership with the company, right? So in that terms, it is cheaper. Uh, flexibility, uh, there are several, uh, especially in Telegro, it tries to map with the cash flow and uh, we try to take the money or, or get the money back only when there are spikes in your cash flow, not a monthly EMI. Uh, so, so those are the flexibility which Interligo at this point in time is providing. We believe and we think there should be a lot of uh, uh, intermediaries doing that because there are a lot of opportunities out there. Uh, yeah, so just to answer those two points from your flexibility and cost point. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, Sorry, it is it is not correct for you to say fine. Yes, there is naivety to assume that equity is easy. Okay. The reason is this that uh, Debt is always x times equity. Okay, so you, as you grow, you can never get as much equity as you want. Okay, so it, you will need to finally reach to a bank which will see the model and fund it. The second part is that it is not right to say that banks will need to pay the money only to the uh, the your contractor or something like that, because that's not how real estate funding ever happens. Okay. Uh, there is banks do have a mechanism where they see the project development which is happening. Eventually, they need to see that the money which has been given is actually getting converted into the building and not as purely a wife. So that's the important thing. It's not therefore right to say that you will the bank will give you condition saying that I'll make a payment only to them because in a lot of, for instance, any of these transactions in the SME, the SME sector. Invoices or bills don't exist okay, because it's very unorganized and banks are lending in that sector, so it's not correct to say that it is that way. You will that's that's where I came from. Probably uh, the need to understand that sector is critical. If you go to a bank which is essentially a commercial or a large corporate uh, funding department, they obviously look at your uh, this one entity in a different fashion. They probably don't like it on the face of it itself. So then these are excuses. You need to go to a bank which has got a team which is used to doing such lending for this sector because there's nothing, uh, it's, it's always that. In your segment, like you said, you've got machinery, you, uh, if you can justify that you've been in presence, there is model, the customer feed faults are there. That's all that the bank needs, so that they know that your ability to make the payment is there. Once that is established and your bank statement show that you are having cash flows coming in, funding of there will come. Mind you, in this segment, like I said, debt equity is more than five times. So you can never get enough of equity at all. No, I mean microfinance sector uh, working slightly in that sector. So if that sector was say 40,000 crores before, before crisis, I think the equity was about 5,000 crores and the rest was the money coming from banks, the most unsecured lending, uh, by the way. You know, over there, still the gearing was three times. You know, it's, it's as simple as this that, you know, if you have cash flows, if you're confident of your cash flows, then I think that is a better way to go. But if you're not, if you're still in a space where you're, where you're burning cash, where you're still innovating, your product is not still, yeah. you know, yeah. developed, I think you have to get the rest money. So there's they are very clear buckets, but uh, and maybe uh, maybe your experience with one bank, whether it's my bank or any other bank, cannot be generalized. There are so many banks in the country, so many branches of the same bank. You know, so different branches will behave differently. So I think you know they have grown large number. Ninety nine point nine percent of the companies have grown with bank money in this country. Just don't uh, write it off. So <laughs> Uh, hi, this is Manoj from Arun. We are with GMI Microfinance Company. 
What I wanted to ask uh, both Shiva and Asim is how much of microfinance lending is actually driven by the fact that it is PSL and how much is, I mean, we call it a good asset class plan. <coughs> <laughs> okay, it has been initiated because it is PSL. Okay, everywhere you need to have a uh, instigation to start the process. It has started off because it is uh, PSL. The happenings, I mean, it would have been uh, the, the thing would have become much better if AP hadn't happened. So in between, the reality has been. Uh, driven into the bank saying that it's not as nice as it seems. But right now, if this was supposed to be withdrawn, you would probably see the sector probably re reducing by about 30-40% what may come out of it. You give, to give you an example, there's an example which is that of other NPFCs. Let's look at the gold loan companies. They grew on the basis of bank lending. Okay, but bank lending was withdrawn from there and clear rules were put very strictly by the RPA saying that no bank lending into the sector will ever qualify by the private sector. But the sector has not collapsed. But of course, these smaller things which happen probably puts a reality check. Actually, the AP incident has also helped the micro sector also develop sensibly. There is a certain sense of caution. In fact, I would say in the NBFC sector, whatever the microfinance companies have done today is amazing you have something like a rating of customers which even today in the normal segment in the open market the civil is still yet to reach most of the segments whereas a microfinance customer the MPRL and the other ratings have actually reached 80% of the customers so it has, it has helped that segment so <laughs> banks will continue to fund into that segment okay because uh, eventually there is so much of competition new licenses coming you need to reach to the bottom of the pyramid I think we have time for one more question, I said. Yeah, just two, two points I've raised. Uh, when you become, assuming there is no BSL, so you're competing with other NBFCs, right? So there is no distinction between you and the other NBFCs so or any other corporate for that matter. So there are two things we could have. One, can you borrow at a commercial you know, rate of interest that your own rating would make the bank lend you? If you're okay to borrow at that rate, I think bank will still be looking at you as a commercial so, given the fact that the size of the MFI is rather small, then I have to, you know, when I take a corporate risk from in terms of, you know, the, the balance sheet size of this guy, so you're competing against larger entities, right? Therefore, while yes, there is definitely you adding value to, you know, financial inclusion, you're doing a lot more, but then, so there is definitely going to be a reduction in the money for you because then, you know, a large company which is doing drug finance or a gold loan company which are much larger, you you are in the same bucket as other MBFCs, and therefore you, know, you have to choose where am I more comfortable at a corporate risk. Cash flows. 
So, uh, as uh, I was saying, if you are a startup and you are still in a product uh, building stage or you are still uh, experimenting with the, uh, with the business model and you are still not sure, probably at that point in time, definitely equity is much, much, much better. Uh, because the cash has to come back from the cash flow. So, if your business plan or business model is not actually supporting that, then probably uh, it is difficult. Which does not mean that you create an Excel model and which uh, essentially ensures that the cash is coming back. It should not be like that. We, uh, we do validate that. Um, so, the business model, as I said, and viability, sustainability. So, business model should replicate the cash and that is what should come out in the presentation. That is the first most important thing. I think we are really out of time, but one last question and then we Hi, I'm Ashira Mehta from IFC. Uh, so we do a lot of projects which involve an, uh, value chain development, you know, with our clients and in the IT sector as well as you know other sectors. And often in these value chain projects, you know, uh, you end up dealing with farmer aggregator groups, right? Like they're farmer production units or cooperatives, producer companies, or societies. And we have had limited success in you know in enticing commercial ties to lend to these farmer groups, you know, we often ban some of the humanity and individual farmers. Uh, but on the other hand, this dominant figure is man, you know, like has a big push towards creating producer companies. We're not uh, seeing the same traction from the banking sector and I wanted to understand is there a reason in, uh, in is there a financial reason for guys to let not go down that path and prefer individual lending? And how can we change that? Because uh, we see this gap a lot in the sector uh, where you know, organizations are, they really need that working capital with these producer companies and they just are not getting it. I think you have already got the answer. Why do you tell me what they told you? The banks, when they said no to it, there should be some reason why they said so. I mean, a lot of questions obviously around, you know, the, it's a, with the governance and you know there are lots of like issues like that which uh, can be worked towards because you know this uh, uh, See, first obviously concern is like, like what's the share capital and you can lend the market what's the share capital uh, the management capability is questioned often you know can the produce company run on its own and ensure you know that the money is going to come back but often in these projects you have buyback arrangements with corporates so you know it's pretty tight in some ways uh, there is capacity building needed for these cooperatives or producer companies, but that can be structured using other grant rewards, uh, not from lending. See, uh, there is a history to this. Uh, when initially the private banks started off their agri lending, the great comfort that they had was to go through the producer companies. Okay, and uh, there was this. At one point of time, the model which was fashionable was that you give money to the company for on lending to the Farmers will produce the whatever the produces and give it back to them. And they were putting it in in place. In our country, the problem is that the farmers are not disciplined and they don't see the long term view. They would normally supply back the produce to the company if the prices of the produce are attractive from the company and not in the open market. There can be conditions where the commodity is priced at higher price than what was negotiated during the buyback. At that point of time, when the price is on the higher side, the, the farmers would just disrespect the contract and go and sell it out in the marketplace. Okay, and the producer company, which has been lent by the bank, would say that the condition was very simple that if we got the money out or we got the produce, we would adjust the use of the farmer and then pay you back. But if we didn't get the produce itself, there's very little that we can do. Okay, so the amount of defaults which happened in this segment was serious. Number two is that uh, what also happens is that the, the regulator also saw some of the banks out which use this essentially to fund the working capital requirements of the producer companies themselves. So it was not actually money going to the farmer. Okay, so the rules and regulations we can tie to where the government said that you need to show clear proof that the money is actually going to the farmer. Okay, and that's, that's what was the requirement of the day. You needed to go and see the face of the farmer and ensure that the money is going actually to him and not funding the balance sheet of the company. 
Okay, that's the second aspect of it. And third one is that over a period of time, what has been realized is that if you are a respectable name as a producer company, yes, banks are willing to do it. But a large part of the producer companies come from the cooperative sector, where there is, to a certain extent, the lack of will to repay, there is interference, and then there is also availability of cheap funds. Mind you, a lot of cooperatives get money from the state level agencies at very cheap funds, at very cheap rates. So there is there is a tendency where they actually ask the banks to lend it below their cost of capital, cost of funds. So all in all, these create problems, and there have been a spate of scandals which happen in these cooperatives, in these state-oriented organizations. All of this puts off the, the banks into the sector. But having said that, it is again, uh, the banks do take calls on specific entities which have been doing this model sensibly. And those, and also they, what they see is that what has been the success rate, what is the volume of, uh, or the tire which the company is able to manage with the farmer in terms of, like for instance, respectable names like IDC, each of our, okay. There are uh, agencies like these which function, which don't actually need money also. And uh, they, they manage to make it into a self-sustaining model. So it is actually happy, good news if you say that banks have now decided to desert the producer companies and directly go to the farmer, which means that they're developing their direct capability to reach the farmer. It's not easy. So it's actually going to be news to the. It's going to be music to the ears of the FBI. Right. So there's also the challenge that on the other hand, a lot of companies need aggregation models. If they have to work with large number of farmers, it becomes very hard for a big corporate, an agribusiness company, to just deal with aggregation farmers. So they, from an efficiency point of view, prefer to deal with aggregator. So then that aggregator will still need finance, right? So it's. I don't know where the solution lies, but there are two sides to this. Yeah, on the contrary, uh, in the Indian context, uh, it is still a challenge for you to reach out to the farmers. Most of the funding which happens by banks in the IT sector actually go to aggregators. The so-called Aratiyas, as we call them, they are nothing other than aggregators. Okay, and formal aggregators. They are, they are formal aggregators. And in fact, the RBI has actually now put a stop to that because they then end up uh, charging a premium to the farmers. So I think Vishnu, there are some follow-up we can take offline. But uh, thank you so much, audience, and thank you, panelists, for coming at some of the very sharp notice and uh, for this lively discussion. Thank you.